That is a 1997 Ford Mustang, and admittedly, I've always really disliked this generation of Mustang, but after driving this for the last few days, I am totally wrong. The mid-90s Mustangs are secretly awesome and super cheap. This particular Mustang is a convertible that we picked up for $8,500, and it's a convertible on purpose because this car is part of a series called From Stud to Dud that we're filming very soon with three convertibles, one from the US, that's this one, one from Germany, it's a Mercedes SL, and also one from Japan, a 300ZX, and this is the last car that we needed to do the series. Now, we need to talk about design of this car, but first of all, we have to pull off the worst modification I've ever seen, and then we'll get to it. So let me pop the hood. Now, this car has the Labra, which I think is pretty funny. It's very 90s, but it also has these headlight covers, which are just an abomination to the world. So those are gonna come off right now. Oh yeah. Breathe headlights, way better. And now with these abominations off, we can talk about design. This generation of Mustang is known internally as the SN95. S stood for specialty, N stood for North America, and 95 stood for the 95th car in the sequence. Now this replaced the legendary Fox body Mustang, which was built from 1978 all the way up through 1993, and Ford spent over $700 million in the development of the SN95. However, it's worth noting, this platform is still loosely based on the Fox body chassis. Now these were built from 1994 all the way through 2004, although this body style only made it from 94 through 98, and then they were heavily refreshed in a model called the New Edge, which admittedly are much better looking. Now this particular fourth generation Mustang is about as grandma spec as it gets. Already these are fairly roly-poly vehicles, even in this GT spec with a wing here in the back. Having the convertible version of a 97 Mustang is, that feels like about the least exciting kind of Mustang that you could have. But overall, ours is in pretty good shape and it has a couple cool elements. I mean, this GT 4.6 liter badge here on the side is kind of a cool retro badge. That part's fun. Uh, and again, overall, it's in really nice shape. Although our composite hood here is showing some really odd wear. It's got all of these little, what appear to be scratch marks on it. That's the most unfortunate thing about the condition of this particular Mustang, but definitely not the most unfortunate thing about the way that this Mustang looks visually. So this generation of the Mustang is a lot of throwback cues to the first gen Mustang, one of which is the prancing horse on the grill. Although Case is quick to point out the mounting system does look a little janky. Now, they went away from these in the 80s. I think the last car to have this was like in the late 1970s on the Mustang. Um, and then it came back for the 1994 model year. Now, a couple other cool things about the SN95. If you got a GT, you had fog lights. So underneath this horrible Labra, you can see fog lights kind of poking through. And this design was pretty revolutionary back in the early 1990s. I've talked to some folks and they said when these came out, it pretty much blew their mind. Now there were actually three concept cars that Ford was um, kind of pondering before they came up with this design. And they were ranked in order from least macho to most macho. So the most macho concept, and we'll show a picture here, was called the Rambo and it was well, it was just over the top in every way, very squared off with this ridiculous rear end. The least macho was called the Jenner. I kid you not, <laughs> throwback to the Kardashians. Of course, Bruce Jenner, who's now Caitlyn Jenner, but was then Bruce Jenner. That was the most kind of flowing and swoopy design. And then this design, which they actually went with, was called the Schwarzenegger. So the least kind of macho was the Jenner, the most macho was the Rambo, and then the design they nailed on was the Schwarzenegger. I can't believe you would call this LeBra horrible, man. Somebody spend good money on it. <laughs> now these fourth generation Mustangs are kind of notorious for fake additions to them, and that even started in the factory with these side vents that are, well, fake. And watching a motor week from back in the day, supposedly Ford said that you could make these vents functional to cool the rear, rear brakes. But uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't really see it. This isn't the only fake addition to this car that appears to be from the factory, There's something else inside. Now this could be a dealer installed feature as well, but it certainly is a Ford part regardless, but this Mustang has this wood, wood 
applique everywhere on the inside. So it's around the cluster, it's down here near the shifter, it's up on the dash, it even surrounds the clock, and it is the most fake looking wood I've seen in my entire life. I think it probably, in retrospect, was like a dealer thing, but whoever spec this car paid a lot of money for something they absolutely shouldn't have. One classic Mustang design element on the interior of this car is the dual cockpit. So you can see the shape of the dash on the passenger side sort of mimics the instrument binnacle on the driver's side. And then something else that's interesting about this section of the dash is right here where it says SRS. This is the only car at least that we can think of that has SRS in a font other than the standardized font. Now when Ford launched the SN95 for 1994, it had two primary engine options. The base engine was a new S6 3.8 liter V6, but the GT model had a carryover from the Fox body, the 302 V8, which is a legendary engine, but was pretty outdated by 1994. So Ford switched engines in the GT in 1996 and went to the 4.6 liter modular V8. Now this engine matched the power output of the old 302 exactly, so 215 horsepower and like 285 foot-pounds of torque. But it's a much more advanced engine, so this has single overhead cams versus the old 5 liter, which used push rods, and in this configuration, it had 16 valves, although a 32 valve version was offered. Now, the big issue with the 4.6 liter is it was considered pretty underpowered by 1996 or 1997 as a case standard, so 215 horsepower, but if you look at like what the Camaro V8s were offering, uh, well into the high 200 horsepower range. Now, ultimately, this was solved, they upped the power in 1998, and then in the new edge model, the power kept going up, and by the early 2000s, you could get the Mustang Cobra Terminator, which had a supercharged V8, and that made 390 horsepower. So lots of different engine configurations. This one though, 215, not a ton of, on paper. One major complaint about the previous generation Fox Body convertible Mustangs is that they were too wobbly, and you can see that if you've ever seen a video of one doing a burnout or donuts, so they added some additional bracing, which you can see here on the top of the struts. And there's also additional X bracing underneath. Something that is modified on our particular car is obviously this cold air intake, which yeah, clearly that's not an original Ford part. This Ford has a solid axle rear diff, although the SN95 is interesting because certain trims, the high performance trims, could actually be had with a independent rear suspension, one of the kind of weird things about these cars. Now this car is equipped with 327 gears, so it's a more aggressive gear ratio than some of them had. Um, and it also has a track lock limited slip rear differential. And another cool feature about this one is these had the optional uh, um, 17 inch wheels. So this car would have had 16s as standard. This one's got the optional 17s. And I actually think they look pretty cool. Although these are some of the weirdest tires which I've ever seen. These are BF Goodrich and they just have this insanely crazy uh, tread pattern. Obviously someone did this um, aftermarket, but pretty wild. Our particular Mustang has the sport bucket seats, which you might be thinking makes it a much better, more high performance, or maybe even more comfortable car. Um, but it really, it doesn't. Uh, really, well, they're not very supportive for one. It's kind of like a couch cushion for better and for worse. But also these seats don't go back very far. I'm only five foot 10 and right here, I'd say I'm round about at the seat position I'm comfortable in. Seat can go forward, but that's as far back as it goes. So if you were much taller than I, I'm not really sure how well you would fit in this car. The seat controls themselves are also weird because instead of being on the side of the seat or on the door where you would expect them, they're on the front. So overall, this car has actually held up really well, and that's one of the great things about these SN95s, is that yes, they are cheap, but parts are also cheap and very, very readily available. Now, I've got the original Monroney to this car, which I think is very cool. Now, you can see that the price before discounts 28,905, and then after this $500 discount, 28,405 in total for this model. That comes out to about $52,000 in today's money. So people complain about how cars are getting more and more and more expensive. Well, 52 grand will get you a pretty nice 
GT convertible, even by 2022 standards. Now, some other cool things on the inside. Well, this one does have the manual climate control, which works great. And I love this little feature from older cars. These had both normal AC and max AC, depending on how hard you wanted to work the system. Of course, aftermarket head unit, because all cars from the 90s typically end up with one of these in one way or another. But if you kind of look up here, this one also has the optional Mach 460 sound system, which was the premium sound option back in 1997. Now, lots and 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 lots of hard black plastic throughout the whole center console. Pretty much everything is made out of just the cheapest material, but look how well it's held up over 25 years. It's the same age as I am, and its skin is looking much better. Now in here, we've got our ashtray. You can see that. We've got these buttons for fog lights, and then this button is for the convertible top, and we'll show how that works now. You have to have the parking brake set, and then it's an electronic convertible top. Now while Tommy is right, it is a power top. One thing that is not power is this cover. That covers up all of the ugliness back here. And when I say ugliness, let me show you what I mean. Look at this. If you don't have that cover on, you can just see some of the, uh, some of the things that this car is built out of that are not necessarily the prettiest to look at. But with that off, I can turn the car on. So I'm not sure how the battery would feel about having to pop this top up. And then it comes right up. Uh, flip a couple. Oh, right, right. Open those guys. And then have Tommy. Or, no, I can push down on it. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Well, we're learning as we go. So you just have to do those levers to lock it, but otherwise, pretty easy. And even though this car is a two door, it does have four window switches because you've got some little corner windows in the back and then of course you have your big front windows. This car is the optional remote key fob, which was a $270 option, but it's nice to have it even 25 years later. It works just about perfectly, which I really, really like, and then you can pop the trunk. Now, one of the more interesting things about this Mustang is the key lock. So I think this is a manual transmission thing, but when you go to turn the car off, you can't simply pull the key out. Instead, what you have to do is push in on this little tab, and then you can kind of twist the key and pull it out. Now, it takes a little bit of getting used to because it's kind of in an awkward spot. Um, some of the Ford trucks had it in a little bit of a better location but this is kind of an old-school way um, of ideally not forgetting your keys or not forgetting to stick it in gear or setting the parking brake now there were several different transmissions available in the 1990s Mustangs now originally this would have had the t5 Borg Warner t5 five-speed manual transmission and then when they went to the new engine they switched to the t45 and actually I like this transmission a lot it's kind of a long shifter and it kind of juts out toward the front of the car but it's got a really good feel to it decently long throws by modern day standards but it's a five-speed manual these are known for being pretty tough and I just like the way it feels It's got a nice little kind of bolt action to it when you uh, go to select a gear at the trunk, you actually get a decent amount of space in here for a convertible. If I was really motivated, I'm sure I could fit back there. So it gives you a pretty solid amount of room. And an interesting fact about the styling on the back of this car is in 94 and 95, the different sections of the taillight were separated horizontally versus vertically on this slightly later model. And then another fun little design detail for this being a Mustang GT is that inset here in the bumper it tells you it's a Mustang GT and our particular Mustang GT has aftermarket exhaust which gives it a pretty good rumble actually it's okay so you a Mustang guy not especially and particularly when it comes to the SN95. I have a secret to tell you, and that is I've always been really into Mustangs, but specifically not this Mustang, because I've always thought they were kind of ugly. However, after driving it, I'm way more on board with this car. Yeah, I have to agree, honestly, because I was the one that drove it to our office from the location that we bought it at, and I didn't want to like it, and I do. All right, let's do a quick acceleration. So we got this straight piece of road here, so we're gonna come to a stop. Oh, a little, little tire squeal. Hey, 5,000 RPM in a second. Feels good. Honestly, for 215 horsepower, it feels pretty sporty. Yeah, it makes a good noise. It's nice and torquey. Uh, 
it doesn't really feel slow and you can totally tell if you had this on a closed course and you revved it up and clutch dropped it you could do donuts and burnouts in this all day long it wants to party what i love about this car is it's one of the few older cars i've driven that does not feel delicate at all no i mean this transmission feels like it'll take you power shifting and the clutch doesn't feel like it's going to be slipping the brakes are pretty good this is a car which you really feel like you can throw around it drives well and when we took it home well home to the office uh, I was driving it on the highway for probably the better part of an hour, and it felt great going highway speeds, no funny noises, no weird wobbles, no difficulty at all. I mean, it's it's an easy car to drive, it's a fun car to drive, and it feels solid. So here comes our handling corner. Oh. So this is where things are probably going to fall apart a little bit. Let me drop it in a second. Hard on the brakes, the nose is going to dip. This car does have ABS, so which is good. Lean! Feel the lean case. Yeah, it's not a refined European sports car. It's not a Porsche 911, but uh, it's a pretty fun car to hustle around. Yeah, what I love about this car is when you're not hustling it around, it is an excellent cruiser. Yeah. So we were kind of giving these seats a little bit of heck earlier, but as kind of lazy boy as they are, it's great for just kind of going in a straight line, driving into the sunset. That's what it's really good at. Yeah, I mean, they're squishy and couch-like, which makes them comfortable to some degree, although yeah, not very supportive. No, there's almost no support whatsoever. And this car has been very well taken care of. So 77,000 miles, I have the uh, original owner's log, and the previous owner owned it from 99 through 2019, and had oil changes done every 1,500 miles. It's got brand new shocks on it, it's got brand new brakes on it. So it's in good shape. So 8,500 is historically a lot of money to pay for an SN95. But if you're gonna get one, I kind of feel like you're better off paying just a couple thousand more and getting one that's sorted than getting one that needs everything. And then the last thing I wanted to point out is if you don't want this car as a cruiser, if you want a car to have fun with, these are super cheap to make into drift builds. Oh yeah. And track builds. And I mean, anything you want to do to the suspension has been done. Anything you want to do to the brakes has been done. So there's lots of resources out there. Yeah, I just love it. I really like this car. I still think it's pretty phenomenally ugly. Yeah. I don't think it's particularly well made on the inside, but if you want just a great cruiser or a reliable car to kind of have fun with, I yeah. use Mustangs. It's really not bad. And if you were to do a hard, hard top new edge Mustang, it would probably have a lot more cool factor. It would. It would also be more expensive. Yeah, New Edge must have been more pricey. So the last thing I want to talk about is they did do a Cobra version of this car as well, which was a little bit higher on power, had suspension improvements, brake improvements, had white gauges, and they're starting to get a little bit expensive, so I see those sometimes in like the fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range. Right. Okay. Expensive relative to 90s Mustangs. Um, sometimes twenty five thirty for a really good one. Really? Yeah. That's for a Cobra. Yeah, I know. We're going for some money now. Um, but what I would do is just get yourself a GT. If it was me, I'd probably get a hardtop. Yeah. Uh, manual like transmission. If you get the 5.0, the earlier engine also bulletproof, you can put power through them. Yeah, just have fun with it. Exactly.